Episode 50 of the Boom Tank Business Show. It is a landmark episode of the show, not only for the milestone of this 50th episode. I'm so deeply appreciative for each of you as listeners around the globe. You have my full gratitude. Thank you so much for listening. It is also a milestone because today's guest is truly amazing. She is a global power connector and author of the top business book, How to Be a Power Connector, the 5 plus 50 plus 100 rule for turning your business network into profits. Inc.com named her book the top business book of 2014, and Darren Hardy's Success Magazine named it a must-read book on its 2017 list of top books on achieving success. Learn the massive business piece missing from most entrepreneurial training, which is this. Build a power network where you can help others and which can help you both accelerate your business and profits. She's known globally as the woman with the titanium Rolodex, and she delivers titanium in this interview we talk about her incredible backstory and how she built her power circle what it takes to do it how you can do it especially if you think you are shy the difference between men and women in terms of power connecting and networking we also talk high level business funding and an angel ecosystem waiting for you she covers angel investors venture capital investors crowdfunding family offices shark tank and the fact there is 369 trillion dollars in global private wealth out there waiting for business investment opportunities. As she says, there is no lack of money. There is no lack of resources. She also says persistence and grit will get you much further than IQ. Marshall, your grit and scrappiness. Just keep going. And if somebody tells you no, she says, yell next. There are many other people out there who will be happy to help. Fascinating interview with the completely incredible and very special titanium force Judy Robinette. Let's get started. Copyright 2017, Boom Tank Media, LLC, fully enforced. Welcome to the Boom Tank Business Show for sharp female entrepreneurs and businesswomen who are ready to shine. A show about more freedom, more income, less worries, and cutting edge information for you to create and grow your business. From branding to social media, marketing to the latest technologies, we've got you covered. Now, here's your host, Carolyn Cole. Welcome to the Boom Tank Business Show for sharp female entrepreneurs and cool guys who support them. This is a show about building your business and your personal development. Why personal development? Because your personal growth is the biggest key to your business success. I'm your show host, Carolyn Cole, founder and business owner of BoomTank.com. I was a Fortune 100 and Fortune 200 company senior trial attorney. Now I make the case on behalf of your business dreams as an online public speaking PR expert. I help entrepreneurs go pro now with their professional talks, live streams, podcast interviews, and other online appearances. I also do inner game coaching and am a business strategist. Go pro now to differentiate yourself and your business as pro in the crowded online business space. Contact me for expert professional help or to book me as your next business or motivational speaker. Carolyn at boomtank.com. Remember, visibility is the lifeblood of your business. Get seen, get heard now. Boomtank.com. So honored and thrilled to have today's guest on the show for you. She was one of the world's top business thought leaders and is known as the woman with the titanium Rolodex. She has been profiled in Fast Company, Forbes, VentureBeat, Huffington Post, Bloomberg Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, The Washington Post, Inc.com, CEO Magazine USA Today, and has appeared on CBS as a sterling example of the new breed of super connectors who uses their experience and networks to accelerate, and that's very important to pay attention to that word, to accelerate growth and enhance profitability. She wrote the top business book, and it is a pure winner, How to Be a Power Connector, The Five Plus plus 50 plus 100 rule for turning your business networks into profits. The book was named the top business book by Inc.com in 2014 and recently made Darren Hardy's Success Magazine's 2017 roundup of the top must-read books on success and being successful. She is set to release her new book, Crack the Funding Code, in fall 2018, and we can't wait for that one. In her more than 30 years of experience as an entrepreneur and corporate leader, she has served as the CEO of both public and private companies 
and in management positions of Fortune 500 companies. She has been on the advisory boards of Illuminate Ventures, an early stage venture capital firm based in California. She was a managing director of Golden Seeds Angel Network, the third most active angel investment group and one of the largest in the U.S. She has been the CEO of publicly traded medical discoveries and she served on the faculty of Goldman Sachs 10,000 Small Businesses Program. She was a member of the Department of Commerce team that defined performance criteria for the Malcolm Baldridge National Quality Award for Performance Excellence in Healthcare, for which she received an award from President Bill Clinton. She has given hundreds of speeches worldwide for audiences at MIT, Bio, Bio Europe, Cal Poly, AT&T, Westinghouse, and the Department of Energy. Without further delay, I welcome our super power connecting businesswoman with the titanium Rolodex. Welcome, Judy Robinette. So totally honored to have you on today. Well, thank you. Thank you. And you can tell how old I am by how long that bio is. I think the only thing you left out was my birthday. <laughs> Do you want to give that? That's completely up to you. Yeah, yeah, March 9th, 1953. Listen to you. There you go, stepping right out with it. I was only joking. What? See, that's why you're power connector. You just bring it all. And the titanium piece, how did you land on titanium Rolodex? You truly do have a titanium Rolodex. You know, I think somebody was interviewing me for an article on Forbes or Fast Company, and I was just throwing out some people that I'd been on panels with, like Mark Cuban or Mark Burnett, who endorsed my book. And 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 I think they put that in there and everybody started using it. So it's been kind of fun. I picture you Shark Tank, but better. Well, you know, I, I don't really have a mean bone in my body, so I don't know that I would fit on there with some of those good old boys who I question their motives a bit. I'm really all about helping people, and, and I've been saddened over the years that women and minorities and have had trouble getting funded, considering there's $369 trillion of private wealth out there. There's no lack of money. So I've kind of made it my mission to help people get funded and to really understand the ecosystem and how it's changed so they can be successful live their dreams. Let's talk about your book, Power Connecting, and your work is so noble, and it comes through not only in what you just said, it comes through from beginning to end with your book. I love this book. Again, the book is How to Be a Power Connector. It's available on Amazon.com. I start with your dedication. I even love the dedication to all my friends, family, and foes for their love, support, and wisdom. How did you land on dedicating your book in part to foes? That's brilliant. Uh, because that's where you learn lessons from. You know, so when I was younger, I'd have a problem, something would go wrong, and I would think, oh my gosh, this is going to kill me. And what I found out is it puts steel up your spine, which ends up being wisdom that prepares you for the next level, which is often called the next devil. And so I'm grateful for the wisdom I've acquired. Gary Vaynerchuk talks about people having gotten too soft. Really, our trials, that's what forges our character. That's what forges our fortitude. Are you finding entrepreneurs are still hungry and they have that fortitude? Or are you finding that they're soft? What are you finding out there in your work? You know, I'm finding that they're just as as hungry as they've always been. I mean, I've loved working with entrepreneurs. I met Rick Alden, who founded Skull Candy. Yes. And at year three was broke and had about a quarter of a million in sales and really needed some help. And I just find that persistence and grit will get you much further than an IQ. And so, you know, you bring up a, a really good point about fortitude and, and grit. And, and, you know, I often say it's just keep going. There's no lack of resources out there. You know, there's 7.4 billion people, 369 trillion in global money ideas. You couldn't even count them. Lots of information. And so everything you need is connected to a person. And so it's, you know, figuring out what resources you need and then figuring out who's got them and how you can get to them. You began this book with your time with your family in Idaho. And I'm not sure if your father thought you were a hippie or you were going to be a hippie, but you were taken to Church of the Latter-day Saints, right? Take us, if you would, please, from the part where your father took you to church, what you learned from the missionaries within the church, and then how that spun out to social work and then the Department of Aging and then into corporate America. The big focus of the church is service and, and really helping others. And, and, you know, one of the things that so impressed me about these young missionaries that go out, 50,000 of them all over the world, is they're selling something that's really difficult to sell, which is a new religion. And you have to learn the ask. And, and that is probably the number one problem that holds entrepreneurs back, particularly women and minorities. They're not comfortable with the ask. And there's been research that shows that if you've been raised lower to middle class, you're taught, keep your head down, work hard, you don't ask for help, and good things will happen. Well, I found out good things didn't necessarily happen. 
that I had to take responsibility. And when I got into the corporate world, I could see other people getting promoted and doing things, and I couldn't figure out what was wrong because I was working hard and I thought I was as smart as they were. And then I understood that beyond the org chart, there was this whole network underneath with the power people and people who had the arm of the decision makers. And so I also learned about how critical it is to position yourself. I'll tell people you can create luck and they'll say, no, you can't. And I'll say, sure, you can't go stand in a train track. Tell me what happens if that's bad luck or good luck. So much is about posturing and positioning. My dad was Southern Baptist, my mother from Mormon roots, neither of them religious, and he did march me to church. And looking back, I'm grateful for that because I learned many good things. You talk about women and minorities, and there's just people in general, maybe a shyness about them or a belief that this kind of transformation that you underwent could not be possible for them. Here's from your book. This is page two. However, growing up, I was far from a natural networker. Until I was 40 years old, I thought I was shy and felt awkward around most people. To be honest, I was terrified of people, not that they would necessarily harm you, but you weren't networking with them. From there, you go into a personal development journey, and from there, you become a social worker for the state of Idaho, and that had its challenges. From there, you got a master's degree in labor and economics, and you worked with the Office of Aging for three years. From there, that was your springboard into corporate America, and in corporate America, you started making those observations. What's so important for some people to hear is this, that when you spotted those connectors within the corporate structure, you set about working on yourself personally to develop yourself to be a networker. And you began talking with people in the grocery store, saying hi, introducing yourself to people on airplanes. Those kinds of measures to step into that role of being a connector, how hard was that for you to make that transition from someone who had been a social worker to now a corporate person to now a corporate power connector? What was that like? I, uh, I knew I had to do something uh, to survive the corporate world. And I think I mentioned in my book that I read How to Win Friends and Influence People because I'd been bullied in school uh, quite badly. And, and so I was very reticent about reaching out to people. I didn't think people would like me. And indeed, research shows half of us don't like talking to strangers because we think we're shy. But the, the uh, psychiatrist will tell you it's only 10 to 12 percent of the population that's shy. The rest of it has to do with your self-worth. And that really was my problem. But after I read How to Win Friends and Influence People and started just saying hi, hello, and uh, smiling, offering to shake hands when appropriate, I found out people liked me. And that kind of opened the door for the, the next level. But, you know, when I was at corporate events, I used to go late and leave early. And I kind of hide out in corners or by the food table. Well, I turned it around to thinking about This is a a person in front of me. They're probably a wonderful human being who's just not a friend yet and trying to focus outside of myself. And it's made all the difference in the world. I've been invited to private events at the White House. I just got back from a week-long trade mission to Serbia. I tell people you can tell how deep your network is when you get invited to these kind of events. And really, the basis of it is being generous and learning how to add value. And when I discovered everybody's got problems and their problems are somebody else's solution, I really became kind of a matchmaker strategist on steroids and had fun. And, you know, I often say to people, just bring me the biggest problem you've got because I love making things happen. And that's why you're titanium. That's fantastic. I want to move now through your book. I'm actually going to go to the end and then come back to Midway. The truth about men and women and how they network or how they communicate, how they connect. I'm going to read these pieces and then I'm going to ask you to comment generally on your thoughts now with what you wrote then. Men build alliances. Women develop networks of relationships. Men network up and down. Women tend to network more peer to peer. Men are rewarded for taking charge. Women are rewarded for taking care. Men create teams, women collaborate. Men are rewarded for advocating for themselves. Women are rewarded for advocating for others. Men are sponsored, women are mentored. Men trade favors, women help. Men network with those who are like themselves, women do too, but they're better at diversity. What do you have to say now 
about the way men and women network. I think it's getting better somewhat, although with a recent spate of sexual harassment, you can see what happens when people in power, and it can be anyone in power, misuses that power. But I will never forget, Carolyn, being at a World Economic Forum in New York and listening to Charlie Rose interview Madeleine Albright. And he said to her, why aren't women in more boardrooms and CEO positions? And she looked at him and said, well, because you men have the power And he kind of uh, laughed a bit and she said, and I I think this is really profound, women form friendships, men know how to network. I often see that as the truth. If I ask people to write down who the core 25 people they surround themselves with, it's often people just like them, same race, same gender, same kind of a job function. They go to the conferences with the same kind of people and they've not stepped out of their comfort zone. And I think it's changed a bit because now we have women. One of my friends, Kristen Brobeck, was on YouTube's founding team. She now has started her own fund. So we see women being able to sponsor, being able to invest in women's startups. And it's important for women to have money. That's how you go and gather a lot of your dreams or have options at least, options for the best medical care, the best schools, the best whatever. We talk about scaling businesses all day long, that's common talk, but how does someone scale their network in a genuine, authentic way, not an obviously opportunistic one? Well, you um, uh, you care about people. You know, research again shows that the two things you look for when you meet someone, number one is a level of warmth, because you don't want somebody that will kill you. Uh, number two is a level of competence, and that one takes a little bit longer to establish but I would add a third, and that's generosity. Just because someone could help you doesn't mean they will. So I tell people to be really open to understanding your own values and what the values are of these other people. And when I was younger, I used to say, I'd only let people in my network who had a good heart, a good head, and a good gut. And finally, I boiled it down to, is this person a Martha Stewart or an Oprah Winfrey. Now, they're both billionaires. They're really good at what they do. But if I had to pick one to trust with my back, it would be Oprah. Now, you know, I've met other people that love Martha, and that's fine. But I think it's really important that you consider those values because I've seen people in corporate America, they used to have what was known as Queen Bee Syndrome, these women who've made it to the top and they go out of their way to uh, hurt women trying to uh, move upward. You want to be careful. You want people who are going to have your back and have your future. And one thing I'll tell people is, you know, avoid the dark triad, the people who are narcissistic, that are Machiavellian and that are sociopaths. And that's about 5% of the population. And, you know, one of my favorite quotes is Oprah, who says, when someone shows you who they are, believe them the first time. And, you know, when I was young, I think, geez, I didn't communicate enough. Maybe that person needs training. Maybe I need training. And then I found I was looking at the tip of the iceberg, and by not dealing with it, I very quickly saw what was submerged underneath, and it was a bad actor. And actually, life is too long to deal with bad actors. And so you just say next. And and because you don't need a lot of people, if you have a core group of 25 to 50 people that you can reach out to when you need a job, when you need funding for your company, when you need media then that's all you need. You don't have to network every day, go to all of these events that are a waste of time. And frankly, the second thing I tell people is find out who the people are you need. So be clear on what your goal is and then find out where those people hang out. We tend to hang out in tribes or flocks like my pet hens in my backyard. (laughs) And and just be yourself. And if somebody doesn't necessarily like you or you have kind of a bad feeling, just say next. I mean, there's 7.4 billion people. You can find whoever you need. At the end of your book in the afterword, you have the top 10 tips from your titanium Rolodex. And tip number one is start with the three golden questions. How can I help you? What ideas do you have for me? Who else do you know that I should talk to? Do you still recommend those three questions? Oh, every single person I meet, I talk to them about that. It's unfortunate, but most of us don't share with others what our story is and what we need. And I'll give you a a good story. So my book agent, Wendy Keller, who got a book contract for me with McGraw-Hill, called me one day and she said, you know, I've got this good friend, Mike Muni. He built and sold the Axe software for 40-some million. He's doing an app for networking. 
you two maybe ought to get together and see if there's something you could do. So Mike flew to Salt Lake. I met with him and I said, you know, I'm a voracious reader, Mike, but I've never heard anything about your app. And he looked really sullen. And he said, you know, Judy, if I could just get in Success Magazine, that's really where those people are that I need to reach out to. And I said, Mike, when you fly home to Texas, I want you to call Wendy, who you've known for years, who I've known for six months. One of her friends is Darren Hardy, who's the publisher of Success Magazine. And he almost fell out of his chair. And I find this time and time again, people aren't utilizing the network they already have. And then it's important when you meet people that you share a, a little bit. And just for an example, every trip I go on, I come home with business cards or contacts from people I've sat in next to the plane, people I've just randomly started talking to. So uh, last week I was in New York. I always fly in and take the subway to, to 51st and Lex. And I have the Hillstone Cafe, which is one of my favorites to get a French dip because they have a quartet playing live jazz. And there's two women sitting next to me at the bar engaged in a conversation. And I noticed the one woman has just this beautiful ring. And I interrupted them. And I said, excuse me, before I fly home, oh, I must know where you got that ring. And they both start laughing and say, what are you doing here in New York? I tell them, and I tell them a little bit about my work. And the one woman said to me, I was the top banker at Goldman Sachs for 30 years. I would love to take you to dinner next time you're in town. So it is so important for you to talk particularly to strangers. And the best thing to do is to ask them a question like that or make a, a wonderful compliment that's, that's heartfelt. I've never had anybody be rude, be nasty to me. I have met billionaires. I've met people you never know who you're sitting by. But certainly, even in the network you've already got, if you reach out to those people and you tell them about your project, your whatever it is that you need them help on, and then what other ideas do you have for me? I, I mean, here's the person in front of you who's got a lifetime of other expertise. And also, on average, people know about 600 people. And by saying, who else do you know I can talk to, you literally are crowdsourcing through that person's network. And it's miraculous. I, I mean, sometimes people will ask me something and I don't have an obvious person to connect them to. I'll send an email out to maybe 15 of my friends. I will always get an answer back. And most of the time, it's not from the person I thought it would come from. Let's go into the far reaches of the country that are not the metropolitan areas or parts of the world where they don't have a lot of advanced things happening. How would someone like that go about reaching out to people who can help them? Would you suggest LinkedIn? What would you suggest for those people? Absolutely. LinkedIn is a must have. Get your profile up there and reach out to people. If you read their profile, and uh, try to find some common ground, compliment them, look at the company they're working at. You know, again, I've never had anybody not agree to accept my invite or to get on the phone and, and talk to me. And you find people who are really successful are often really open to talking to you. And, and that's usually something you wouldn't anticipate, but it really is true. And, and that's back to the ask of, of asking people. And, and most people are good and they'll help you if they can. Almost any small community has got a community college with professors with every kind of expertise you could think of. Every small community has got a millionaire or two. Almost all of them have a chamber of commerce. But certainly, you know, so much with social media platforms, you can find and reach out to uh, to, to anyone. I think now LinkedIn has 400 million people. I just came from the, the trip in, in Serbia, and they've gone from communism to socialism to democracy. And interestingly, I told my friend Kevin Harrington, who was the first shark on Shark Tank, I was going to Belgrade, and he said, oh, I, I've met this entrepreneur over there. Will you meet with him and tell me what you think of his business model? And I had a great time with this guy. Well, even though they don't have a lot of venture capital groups, he would figured out how to get himself funded. Probably the best word is being scrappy. You know, I like grit and, and I like being persistent. Be a little scrappy. And it doesn't matter where you live. I mean, now with social media, 
uh, you can get in touch with anyone. In your book, you have the five mistakes most networkers make. I'm just going to focus on one so we can keep moving now. I want to get to the, the venture capital piece. Instead of connecting with individuals and organizations that can provide the higher level support they need, most people spend too much time with those at their own level of knowledge and skills or lower. And I think you hit on that. That is truly a self-esteem issue. It's so important for people to move beyond their circle, as you say, in a scrappy, persistent way. Do you agree with that? Absolutely. And this really has to do with self-worth. And this was me. I mean, I didn't know a millionaire. And now I'm friends with numerous billionaires. And you find out everybody is the same. Everybody's got problems. They may have more cash in the bank than you. Mike Milken once said the three things that everyone is most concerned about. Number one is their family. Number two is their health. Number three is their finances. And I would add their pets. And, and I find this to be true universally, that if you focus on the heart and being uh, generous and being kind, you can get in any door. It was so interesting. I was reading a comment by Joan Rivers. She said, the smartest thing I ever did was go through every door that was ever open to me. Would you speak to, please, people taking advantage of the opportunity? By that, I mean accepting it, welcoming it, taking a chance, taking every opportunity that presents itself. Yeah, and this is one I struggled with, honestly. It took me a, a long while because I thought I had to have all the information. I had to, you know, be able to to do the job before I applied. And that one really changed my assumptions. And I must tell you, probably 80% of our assumptions are false. Just for fun once, I sent a resume and I thought, what's a stamp? And I got interviewed and ended up getting the job and doubled my salary. And research, again, will show that men will do that all the time and women won't. They'll think they don't have enough expertise, enough knowledge. So it's important to step out there. Do you still promote actively the 550-100 power circle? Yes, absolutely. Because research shows groups fall apart at 150. I met a guy once in Utah who's pretty well-known venture capitalist, and he said, you know, Judy, I've got 40,000 people on a Google Doc, and I'm, you know, sending out Christmas cards. And I'm like, dude, how many of those people have ever helped you? Well, it was less than 15. So I find it's more important to have high-level relationships that quality people and nurture those relationships. And you don't have to talk to them every day or, or every week, but, you know, so you can really truly have someone's back. And, and I call that being robust. And so, for instance, I adore Mark Burnett. I, I didn't know him until I got a little scrappy and got him to do the intro to my book. And when he became the CEO of MGM, I just jotted a quick email, congratulations. And he wrote back to me in 30 minutes. And so robust means that people will return your calls, will answer an email the same day, will get back to you, and will help you. I want to, for the audience, just share your circle of 150, the top five. You say, these are the five people closest to me. I connect with these people almost daily. These are the people I would trust with my life. Then there's the key 50 people in your life, the 50 important relationships that represent significant value to my life and business. I tend these connections carefully, and I am always looking for ways to add value to them. And then the vital 100, the 100 people I touch base with at least once a month, both the human touch and added value are critical to my keeping these relationships fresh. How do you find time to reach out to all of these people monthly, Judy? It's pretty easy. I subscribe to Quartz.com, which is kind of a global newsletter that has you know, curated information, great little stories. It covers everything from the world of finance to the world of sports. And so if I look at people in my network, there's probably 25 of them that are really high-end venture capital, angel investors, family offices, and I'll get something that really is solid that they probably haven't seen, and I'll send it to them swiftly. So for instance, this morning on PitchBook, there was an article on what's the latest stats on venture capital for the year. And I sent that to probably 15 people. So it isn't that, you know, I'm just finding one thing to send to one person. I pretty well know what people like and, and don't like and, and what they would find valuable. And by the way, you can do this by, you know, for instance, tomorrow I'm flying to San Francisco. I got invited to the Churchill Club. It's a highly curated private group. 
Um, and they're going to have, I believe, the CEO of LinkedIn and the head of Markle Foundation. Um, and, you know, I got invited to that just by helping somebody else. And going to something like that and then getting information that I can share out. I mean, I've got the agenda from the White House, my last meeting that was on fintech, and I will often share that with people. So I kind of keep a radar up a little bit of information that will be valuable to people or inviting. So this Churchill meeting, I'm taking uh, David Jacks, who was the first CFO of PayPal on their founding team, and my good friend, Gwen Edwards, who is a, an investor and runs the Golden Seeds chapter out of San Francisco. And so things that would be of value to people, I've gotten people invited to Renaissance Weekend, places that they probably couldn't have been invited to. So you just think about how can you add value? But the reality, Carolyn, is if somebody calls you and they just like really care about you and they really listen, I mean, that's a big deal. That's a gift itself. You just care. It's a huge deal. One of your chapters is make your network wide, deep, and robust. And you just displayed that for us. The key piece of this, and you talk about this in your book as well, is an ecosystem. And it's clear there is an ecosystem of high achievers with big hearts. And in that ecosystem, the understanding is we will help each other. We will make life better for each other. We will watch for each other. Is that how that functions by your design, or is that just generally how that ecosystem works, Judy? Well, it is because I've carefully picked people that share my value, and most of my friends want to make the world a better place. Uh, and this is from billionaires down to you know, my neighbors. Uh, but much of the ecosystem does do this, because without products and services that make the world a better place that people want to buy, there's no business. I mean, the reality is there's a good, very good side uh, to business and, and to markets. The gentleman I met in Belgrade, he has a company called Easy Going that has a kiosk that allows you to apply for a bank. You don't have to fill out papers. It has like a screen at the top that they can do marketing and advertising. He's already got them in Russia and Eastern Europe, and it's going to make a radical change by making things easier for people who generally have not had access to just like cell phones have for people who can't bank. And so a lot of us find it really fun to do these challenges because we can see what good it would do in the world. And uh, certainly people will make money as well. And the overarching theme of Boom Tank and the people attracted to it, it is make the world a better place because at the end of the day, people say, why are we here? The reason we're here truly is to develop ourselves to help others. That's kind of the bottom line of it. When people are going through mental barriers to power connecting, you have a great chapter on this as well. The problem is I'm shy. The fix, you don't have to be an extrovert. You just have to engage. The symptom, I'm self-conscious. The fix, be other focused. The symptom, strangers equal danger. The fix, every important contact you have was once a stranger. Strangers equal opportunity. I absolutely love that chapter. And when you start looking at people as people and not strangers, that's when the magic happens. You knew when you were listening to jazz that you wanted to talk to two people. How much does intuition play in your power connecting, Judy? Because intuitively, obviously, you knew that would be a good conversation and you had it. Where does that fit in your life? You know, it used to be risky for me to ask a question, but since I've never had anybody turn me down, I can tell you, I would dare talk to anybody anywhere. I now have talked with, worked with enough billionaires, millionaires, regular folks. I have no fear. I, I mean, there's a reason somebody recently wrote in an article that there's uh, no fear in the Bible every day for the year, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> and and I, I think when, but I think we are so taught that strangers are, are danger that by the time we grow up, we've not given up on that. And, and there's some interesting research that shows that when people step out of their boundaries and talk to strangers, uh, they tend to be able to take more risks and they're more well adjusted, uh, which I find really interesting. And, and by the way, I'll share that article and you can put it in the show notes and, and I'll send the top 10 notes for you as well. Terrific. And those show notes will be available for this episode on boomtank.com. What, in your opinion, separates 
the billionaires and the millionaires from the rest of the population? How did they get there, Judy? I think some of these people certainly have the genetic propensity to be extreme risk takers. Uh, Most of the entrepreneurs I know fly planes. I I learned how to fly a helicopter. I I love riding horses. I've met people who would be afraid to get on a horse, which, you know, I find really interesting. I never would have given it a second thought. But there is probably some genetic propensity towards taking risks. Uh, Some people are really focused on security and want to have that regular uh, paycheck. But a lot of people are also wanting to be financially independent and are pretty good at fixing problems or seeing a problem that needs to be fixed. And and sometimes this is very accidental. You know, like the people that started Airbnb, they were about out of money and and they decided to rent out a bedroom. I, I mean, that was how that started. And, you know, often these people start out of the garage and they keep going. Uh, You know, often the startups will have uh, mistakes and we call it pivots, but if there's a customer out there and it's helping somebody, they learn to keep going. And and one of the things is they're coachable and they learn. I'm going to finish your mental barriers to power connecting. The symptom, networking is manipulative. That's the thought that's limiting the limiting behavior. The fix, don't network, connect. Limitation, I have nothing to offer others. The fix, create a victory log of your accomplishments no matter how small. They won't like me. The fix, if you like others, they're likely to reciprocate, but make respect a requirement of any relationship. And I love this last one. I'll get rejected. The fix, yell next. I absolutely love that. It's it's so powerful, right? It is. It's yell next. It's exactly what you say. Just yell next. And it could be a temporary no, but regardless, yell next. It's absolutely fine if people turn you down because there are many more people out there who will be happy to help you. That just brilliant advice. Do you have anything you want to add to that list of mindset limitations? Yeah. So the one that really helped me, honestly, was the victory log. And and I read an article that I think was in a, an airplane magazine when I was 30. And it talked about doing this victory log. And I started doing it. And, and I have in there when I made 28000 a year and when I made 350000 a year. When I did a first trip to Mexico and now I've done 40 trips to Europe and been to India and all kinds of places. And if I look back to when I first started doing it when I was 30, I would have never guessed in 100 years I'd ever go to India or the White House or write a book. And you'd mentioned this before about the fear. And I often say, say yes to the universe. I, I mean, sometimes I even feel like I'm on this train going really, really fast. and I'm not quite sure where I'm going. And I can tell I'm a little anxious and fearful. But I say yes. And, you know, there's a couple of quotes that I love, and and one of them is that you have to shake the apple tree hard to get the apples to fall, but it's never the one you shake from that they fall. And it's almost like a requirement that we have to be in action. We have to be taking action and instead of just sitting and, and thinking and praying. I mean, all of those things are really, really good, but, you know, you have to get in the game and play the game. Einstein, one of my favorite quotes is, if you're going to play the game, you'd better know the rules. Well, each of these ecosystems has different rules, different ways you access people, but you can learn it. There's there's nothing you know new really out here that you can't learn. I'm going to test this on you, Judy, and you've probably heard this in different forms before, but this is what I put in a podcast episode recently. The secret requirement, and people don't talk about this, at least they don't articulate it. The secret requirement to success, to be in the game, is exactly what you just said. You must take action. I believe you also must fail. You must regroup with a different approach. Then you will be rewarded because that is the quiet rule of the game to succeed. You have to be in action. You're going to have to have some things that don't work. You're going to have to stick in, apply the grit, rework yourself, come back, and then success will come to you. What do you think of that? Yep. Absolutely. You know, so uh, when I was young, I gave a speech at MIT and somebody handed me an article that to be financially independent in America. And the research showed there are five ways, be a doctor, a lawyer, inherit it or marry it. And I went, well, the first four out. And number five was start a business. And I went, start a business. How hard could it be? And I, I got a couple of my friends and we, I mean, stupid us, did a franchise restaurant. 
And I, at one point, thought I was going bankrupt and, and went to a bankruptcy attorney just terrified. And he looked at the financials and he said to me, you know, you're not even close. And I said, but I'm broke. And he said, Judy, they can break you, but they can't eat you. <laughs> uh, and, you know, they can't kill you. Right. I, I mean, regardless, you're always going to have your life. There's, yeah. You can always come back. Right. And, you know, something I'll say to people, and I read this a few years ago, and, and it really is true. Imagine the worst thing that has happened to you. And where would you be now if that had not happened? I just wrapped a J.K. Rowling episode. I did a solo take on her, how uh -huh. she talks about the potentiality of the human spirit. There's magic within us because we have the ability to imagine better. That's the magic that we have, and it's invaluable. I asked the members of the audience to consider if she hadn't been down on the bottom rung, fighting just to stay alive, would you even listen to her advice and her commentary on your potentiality now if she had not been through those things? The answer is largely no. It is those yeah. things that make us great. It just is. From the bad stuff comes the great yeah. stuff. Thomas Edison was abused as a child and had lost hearing in, in one ear. You can go through countless people that have, have done great good, whether it's art or opera or, or whatever, and you often read the backstory and you find out that they kept being scrappy and overcoming the hand they were dealt at birth. What is at your core that you think brought you from being a social worker in Idaho to where you are now? What would you attribute that to? My love of learning and my curiosity and liking to make things happen. If I have this right, you do so many things, but one of them is putting early stage companies in front of angel and venture capital investors. Tell us about that work and how that operates. I, uh, when I was CEO of a public biotech company, I would give speeches at the big bio conferences around the world, and I would meet doctors and researchers who arguably had a cure for some kind of cancer and could not figure out how to get funding, even though there's no lack of money out there. And it broke my heart a little bit. And I started uh, really paying attention to it. And at about the same time, I had raised $8 million for, for that biotech company. And so I'd learned the art of, uh, and the science of, of raising money. Somebody asked me, it was an angel investor in Park City, if I'd look at Skull Candy, which was this unknown startup. And the, the founder had been bankrupt about three times. So uh, the investors were a little cautious, thinking, you know, what if this guy does bad yet again? But I figured out how to solve that, how to mitigate risk as viewed by the investors by putting in some high-powered board members and, and some other things. And so then I saw it was just kind of a, a challenge, and other people started coming to me for help. They'd been frustrated, knew they had something great, and couldn't. They didn't understand the ecosystem. So, you know, most people have never heard of family offices. These are wealthy people who have someone manage their money, do investments. 81% of family offices now invest directly into startups. And there's 3,000 family offices in the United States. There's corporate venture capital arms. There's individual angels almost in every town. There's super angels like Ron Conway, who's probably the best known billionaire out of Silicon Valley venture capital groups. There's 300 angel groups across the United States, equally from north, south, west, east. When you understand that game or that ecosystem and know you can go to their website, you can get warm referrals from the Chamber of Commerce or the Small Business Development Center, which, by the way, there's one in every single county in the United States. Those people all have connections. So that's probably the best answer. Help us understand the opportunity here. We hear of tech startups right and left. What other kinds of startups qualify for this kind of funding and help? So angels want three to five times their money back in three to five years. VCs typically want 10x. And there's very few that are really funded by VCs, and actually very few funded by angel groups. But there's this huge pot of money, $60 billion, that comes from friends and family. So usually people start out with their own money, credit cards, mortgaging the house, go to their family and friends. And then when they get traction, they have people who are actually opening their wallet, paying for this. Then usually the, the angels are, are very interested in, in talking with them. 
And for instance, Golden Seeds, they not only invest in high tech, they invest in consumer products, they invest in medical devices. And there are, you know, the life science angels in San Francisco, all they do is life science. All, all they do is medical devices and everything related kind of to healthcare. But you can figure that out on the sites. And you know, there is no lack of money. And it's just understanding who is the best fit for you. And it just takes a little research. There's the National Venture Capital Association online. There's also the National Association of, of Angels uh, and family offices. What trends are you seeing now in terms of startups, in terms of funding? What's happening out there that has your curiosity? Certainly initial coin offerings, ICOs, everything related to blockchain. I recently, in the past few months, was in New York judging a pitch event for Evan Nielsen, who has a fund that is everything to do with artificial intelligence, virtual reality, and it's going to so change the world. I uh, met a, a doctor who gave her pitch. You just use your iPhone, take a picture of your teenager's pimples. Uh, with 98% accuracy, it can diagnose it and tell you what medication to take out of the thousands that are out there. It's going to be incredible, the changes with artificial intelligence, uh, virtual reality. Those are big to-dos. And certainly all the things that are happening with big data and all of the algorithms that go behind this are of interest. Uh, besides the changes to the ecosystem, like what I mentioned, family offices, also crowdfunding. When crowdfunding started, everybody said it wasn't going to work. I mean, I met with the SEC. They were pretty mad. We were going to steal from the children and the orphans. I think Indiegogo surpassed a billion last June when I was at the White House. And now we have equity crowdfunding. So I see that the general population is getting better educated. And part of this has to do with Shark Tank. It's one of the top rated family shows. So you know, even teenagers can come up to me and talk about valuation. And it's nice because back in the day, our school system was started and ran like precious. And it was to teach people how to be a good soldier or a good worker. There wasn't much about being an entrepreneur. Now people can see that and choose it as a path and see if that might work for them. All of these changes, and I think Web 3.0, all of the changes in social media platforms, you know, Amazon hit the highest it ever has in the stock price. I think it's $1,800 today. Just amazing shifts through throughout the world. And there's always possibilities for change and technology and people coming up with, uh, you know, it can even be a simple idea. The guy that came up with the pet rock became a multimillionaire. When we're looking at crowdfunding and you're looking at investors in general, is there a secret to a pitch? I mean, it's obviously always going to be numbers. It's going to be the potential that your idea has and how you can demonstrate that in a concrete way. But is there any other secret or magic touch to a pitch when you are making one? Yeah. You know, I, I tell people no more than 12 slides. You need to focus on the, the management, the team. The first thing that the investors are going to look at is the team. Can they execute? Anybody can put together a good budget. You need to have information about the market. You need to have what your ROI is going to be, what your exit is going to be. I remember giving a presentation once and a woman came up to me and she said, do I really have to at some point sell my company if people have invested? And I said, yes, they want their money back. <laughs> so it, it's important. And, and one of the things I teach people is you need to make that slide deck be viewed as from the point of what the investor is looking for. How can you mitigate the risk? There's always risk, you know, whether it's market risk or, or whatever. And I'll send a couple of articles to you that you can put in the, the show notes about the pitch deck and what investors to avoid, because some angels are devils and some ventures are vultures. Uh, and, and so I'll send you a, a few articles that you can add that can help people. Terrific. In closing, is there anything that you would love to share wisdom-wise with the entrepreneurs listening? Keep asking. Uh, make sure a, a lot of people think that the companies fail because of lack of funding. The number one reason is lack of a customer. Make sure that you have a customer. If you don't have a customer, it's just a hobby. There's a, a lot of work that's been done on lean startup. I, I tell people to start there. Don't sink a ton of money into something until you've really found a fit in the marketplace. You know exactly who's going to pay for your widget or whatever it is. Perfect. The book is fantastic. It's still available on Amazon, still a bestseller. How to be a power connector, the five plus 50 plus 100 rule for turning your business network into profits. Can you tell the audience how they can find you and how you can help? 
Yeah, so you can find me on LinkedIn. It's just Judy Robinette. My website's www.judyrobinette, and I'm on Twitter at Judy Robinette. So you can find me almost anywhere, and, and I'm happy to help. Uh, that's so nice of you, and thank you so much for joining us here today. We will be on the lookout for your book, Crack the Funding Code, available 2018, the fall of, and we wish you nothing but the very best. And I certainly want to know after this call how I can help you, the golden question, because you have done me an immeasurable service and the audience coming on the show today, and I'll be forever grateful for it. Thank you. I'm delighted. Before we close out, let's connect on LinkedIn and Instagram. I'd love that. I'm Carolyn Cole live on those platforms, and thank you for tuning in to the Boom Tank Business. The show. I so appreciate you listening, and you know I do. If you like the show, please leave a five star rating and some nice comments on iTunes or subscribe on Stitcher or Google Play and tell a friend. Join Boomtank's email list at boomtank.com and download my free ebook, The Best Online Tools to Grow Your Business Now, containing over 75 plus hot links to grow your business. Be sure to download your free online public speaking PR jumpstart with a sample media one sheet at boomtank.com too. Until next time, free your mind, unleash your spirit, build your life create your business it really is your show see you right here on the next episode thank you for tuning in to the daily boom tank business show go to boomtank.com and get our exclusive tips and ideas to help you achieve success it is time for you to launch your dream business and life now